First of all, just talking a little bit about the Center for the Inland Bays. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, we're one of 28 estuaries of national significance as identified by the U.S. Congress back in 1988. As a result of that, we are part of the National Estuary Program, which is administered by the U.S. Department of uh, Environmental Way, uh, Protection Agency. Um, and so uh, we are uh, an important element of a national effort to protect our valuable estuaries on all of our coasts around the country. We are also a product of the Delaware Legislature and the signature of then Governor Tom Carper, which created the Center for the Inland Bays back in, when was it? 1994. So if you add it all up real quickly, you'll realize that this is our 30th anniversary. So. Uh, we look forward to opportunities to celebrate that anniversary. Stay tuned because we'll certainly give you the opportunity to do that with us in a number of different ways in several different venues. Um, but what's important and where I think it, we can be particularly relevant here is to describe a little bit about what is it about these trees? What is it about all of our watersheds here in Delaware? I'll talk about the Center for the Inland Bays and the Inland Bays, which is one of our three major watersheds here in the state. Um, the inland bays are about 300 square miles. That's it. Uh, there is a watershed for the Chesapeake Bay, which let me just say is a bit bigger than that, <laughs> ranging all the way from New York State down to Virginia. We have a manageable piece of property that supports our bays that we can get our arms around, that we can identify the stresses that climate change and rampant development are going to have on that landscape. And we can then work together uh, to resolve those things. And that is our job. The law says that our job is to restore, protect, and preserve uh, the inland bays and their watersheds. So that's what we do. The trees are an integral part of that. Um, as, uh, as, as Jill mentioned, you know, these trees are doing an, an incredible job for us. Uh, and we need to do an incredible job for them. Uh, they do, for our purposes, provide an incredible protection against the flow of excess nutrients, pollution into our, our streams, our ditches, uh, rivers, and our bays. Um, and they do so much more in terms of sequestering carbon dioxide and helping us with the other side of the, the climate problem. Um, but they're also beautiful, they're habitat. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get a little bit more granular in terms of our places uh, around the bays. Um, but one of the things that, that strikes me, and you're all familiar with it, what do you see on the cover of Beach Life? Every issue. It is the thing that we want to brag about in this part of Sussex County. If the Center for the Inland Bays, if all of our partners and all of you aren't doing our part, this isn't going to be anymore. And so this is the reason that we all need to work together to do this. We are looking to do and celebrating, actually many of you who are partners with us already as volunteers or otherwise, to help us in our next 30 years to make sure this is still our vision. Because if it isn't, uh, then we've lost. And, and we don't want to do that, of course. Um, so the, the important thing there, of course, is our collective voices. Um, and so this is an opportunity to celebrate the planting of this tree and the reason this tree was planted. Sussex 2030, Yule Lee's efforts with her many, many partners um, are an important part of that partnership that we all need in order to protect things that's most valuable to us. The Sussex Preservation Coalition taking all of these bodies, all of these efforts, all of these particular and very parochial in some cases, needs and desires and hopes and bringing them together into a collective voice that can't be ignored. And that's what we need. We've got other people that have their interests and their desires for the future of the bays that may or may not end up looking like that. But in the end, they and we and everybody realize that if we're not doing this right, we're not gonna have that. So this is why it's so important. And, and I just point out that with, you know, Marissa's work with the Sierra Club and the League of Women Voters and all that they do, um, and with Mark and his folks with the Land Trust, 
um, and even with our partners at the Inland Bay's Garden Center, people with knowledge, people with commitment, people with passion working together are going to be the thing that allows us to have a future that we can be proud of here and where we would want to actually bring our next generations to be. And so with that, um, you know, thank you, Jill, and thank you to Jane as well for the opportunity to be here today with all of you all. This is just a fabulous opportunity to talk a little bit. There are rules, and rule number one as it relates to trees is keep what we have as much as we possibly can. This tree is beautiful. This tree has a future. It's wonderful. It can't compete with any one of those trees out there for the ecological value that those trees provide. And these oak trees, as I'll mention here in a little bit, are incredible. They're very powerful as individual trees. They are massively important as a collective. And so our forests, our woods, our wetlands, all of these natural resources, we need to hang on to because it is their functioning and their success that makes it so that we want to be here, we want to have more places for the people to stay and to develop the land. Well, you know, there's a downside to that too. And so part of our job along with you is to help folks to understand what are the other values of this space? What are the other values of this land? What are the other values? So that we can have a real solid discussion on merits. What are the merits and the demerits of proceeding forward with reforestation, with development, with all of the things that we as humans might want to do in our landscape, but do it thoughtfully and make decisions that ensure that this is our future. The second part, the second rule is reforest what we can, as much as we can. But it's not only about these massive places and the work that the Department of Agriculture or we or other partners are doing to put trees in place. That's a very important part of our job. And obviously it's going to be important for our watershed, all of our watershed, to have those trees there where they were not before. Um, and I would just say that we are blessed as a center to have Megan Millie Fellows, who many of you know, on board as our Director of Science and Restoration. If anyone knows reforestation, she does. And she's at the cutting edge of research into how to do it right. So that you have the right mix of trees in the right places with the right support in order to make sure that we can recreate these forests of the future uh, to make up for the losses that we suffered in the past. But I think the most important part of this message is we can bring it home. We're all important. We're all important as part of that SBC Sussex 2030 set of voices. And we need to do that. But what we sometimes don't realize that we can do this at home. We have yards, we have turf, we have all of this stuff. And to borrow from someone that you're also probably pretty familiar with, Doug Tallamy, who is the uh, as a professor of entomology and wildlife biology at the University of Delaware, bring nature home. And we can do it. It doesn't matter whether you live on 10 acres or one tenth of an acre. The choices you make make a big difference. And why is that? Over uh, close to 90% of all the land east, east of the Mississippi is owned by people. It's privately held. It is not public land. It is not your parks. It is not your nature preserves. It is not any of that. It is backyards. It is property where somebody has some control. So think about what you want to do with that piece of property. Um, for example, I have to my next page. Oh, and actually relevant to this is another quote. I love quotes, so here you go. The oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. <laughs> Aldo Leopold, who is probably the father of conservation, if there ever was one in this country, uh, made that statement uh, some, some years ago. Um, but anyway, you know, it's what we're doing as individuals that have a capacity to do this really important. And that's why it naturally follows that I would talk with you about caterpillars. Caterpillars, trees, Aren't they bad? They eat the leaves off the trees, they defoliate them, they kill our trees, we don't like caterpillars. Actually, we love caterpillars. And I'm gonna tell you why. 
So an oak tree like this can support, according to Doug, 557 species of caterpillars. You know, those are the moths and butterflies that ultimately, you know, lay their eggs and the caterpillars are produced and all the rest of that. Why is that important? Well, chickadees. Let's talk about chickadees for a second. Where do they feed their babies? Good guess. Good guess. Not just any small number of caterpillars, but six to 9,000 caterpillars for one nest of little fledglings. And that's a lot of caterpillars. Why is the oak so important? Well, you've got those 557 species of caterpillars that like those things, but not every caterpillar can eat every leaf. And this is why native plants are so important. These critters evolve together. So we need the caterpillars, we need the oak trees because they evolve together. And so those caterpillars can eat those oak leaves. Other ones can't, because why? Plants have an incredible defense system. That's why during this time of year and all through the summer, you'll look out in a space like this and it's green. It's because not everybody can eat those leaves and not everybody does because they're toxic. But the ones that evolve together can and do. And if you were a chickadee, what would you want to feed your little one? A beetle or a nice, fat, plump, nutritious caterpillar? And chickadees aren't the only birds that make that choice. Lots and lots of bird species actually depend on caterpillars as their primary and preferred food source for their little babies. So those of you who love little birds, you know all about live mealworms. Now there's a reason for that. So basically you look at it as an actually nutritious hot dog as opposed to trying to feed your, your little bird, uh, you know, a rock, which is what a beetle would represent. thing then about sort of our action and our opportunity. I don't know how many of you have lawns, but they are, according to Doug Tellamy, dead zone, ecologically unhelpful. So one of the options and one of the things we can talk with our communities about, let's have less lawn because they don't do anything for our environment. They don't do anything for the quality of our lives in that regard. But people don't know that. But if we were to take, say, half of our lines, 40 million square miles of our country is turf. Ecological dead zones. Why would we want to tolerate that? But the fact that most of it is in our backyards, collectively, we can make a huge difference. So if you got room, you want to plant a tree, plant an oak tree. If you want to know what other plantings are good, I would suggest talking with Cheryl and Denise over here at the table. You can also go to the National Wildlife Federation site and they have a wonderful um, uh, portion of the site that's called Native Plant Finder. Plug in your zip code, they will tell you what are the ecologically valuable keystone species that you should be looking for and you ought to populate your yard with. The other thing too is, you know, people are afraid of trees. You know, why is it that we're like clear cutting all of these properties and all the rest of it? Used to be that people wanted to have their home and they wanted to live where the trees were. And as it gets hotter, by the way, with climate change, a big for your energy bill, uh, for your quality of life. And this is true in our communities. So, what we need to do, whether it's an HOA or a small town, whatever it is, is let's work together to say, you know what, this green lawn thing. So let's come up with the alternatives actually support the life that supports us. By the way, if you have questions about whether your trees are safe, and it's a legitimate question, but contact an arborist who actually loves the trees, who wants you to keep that tree if it's safe and can be confirmed to be safe. And just as an example, and you can find others, but Jeremy Hager at Coastal Plant Care is the kind of person that you want to engage as a community if you're trying to figure out what to do with all of your trees in your HOA or as a person who's trying to get the right consultation with regard to your trees in your yard. So that's that's the message. Um, the message is that uh, you know, if we can do this together, again, uh, paraphrasing out the Leopold, one of our oldest jobs is to live in the East 
So anyway, thank you for the invitation to be here. Go out and do good things. I look forward to working with all of you to, to be the voice that we need to be on behalf.